Good morning. Hey, first of all, uh, Tyler, that was a great message. It was a great sermon you just preached. Uh, I was in the back. I got saved on that one announcement. Um, I'm so proud of all of you. You're here. You changed your clocks. You did very, very well. We're, we're, listen, when the people start coming in in the next 15 minutes, 20 minutes with that dazed look on their face, just love on them, hug them, don't condemn them. We don't want to bring guilt and shame on people. Hey, yesterday we had our men's conference here, Iron Sharpens Iron, and we had about 800 guys, and it was awesome. And I looked on the flyer a couple weeks ago, or last week, and I, I noticed that Ted Roberts' name was on there, and Ted Roberts pastored in Gresham, a large church, I think of about 7,000 people, had a real calling and gift uh, to help people with addictions and sexual issues. And so uh, some of you are, you might, can we, is it okay if we get a little uncomfortable sometimes? I think some in the church, we don't want to hear about that stuff. You know, ah, that's worldly. And um, well, we do need to talk about it because it's rampant in our day. It's rampant in the church. It's not just rampant in the world. It's rampant in the church. So if you don't have an issue, which we all do, have issues, but if you don't have necessarily a sexual addiction thing or something like that, you should just receive truth today so that you can go be a blessing to somebody else that's struggling. Don't look at this as just all about you and boy, I don't really deal with that, so I'm just going to tune out. Uh, you know what? Take notes because God might call on you to, to help somebody that has an issue in their life. So I'm very excited. Ted was a fighter pilot in Vietnam. He's got some great stories. This is a man of God in our midst, and when I saw his name, I said, we can't have Ted here in our conference without speaking to our church on the weekend. It would be a, a sinful thing for us because this man has many years of great ministry, and, and I want him to come and impart to us something of the Lord that, where you might be helped and you might be healed. Amen? Amen. Would you please welcome Ted Roberts? Well, good morning, precious flock. How you doing? Good. You're here an hour early. Give yourself an applause. Yeah, come on. <laughs> wow. Had a great time with the men. Uh, I travel literally around the world now. Uh, just did a men's conference, large one in Hong Kong. And one of the things that impressed me the most was your pastor. Because in men's conferences, you'll see pastors jockeying for position, and it's, it's sick. It really is. But your pastor was back supporting, playing the guitar, just being a great servant. I really, really was impressed with his character. You got a great shepherd. So make sure you tell him that, okay? Well, you know, you can tell a lot about a person by looking at their screensaver. Tomorrow morning when I get in my office for a whole day of counseling, intense counseling, uh, this is my screensaver. Here's what I'll say. That's Aslan <laughs> going, I can't believe Ted just did that. <laughs> did what? Well, here's a classic example. so dark and you don't know what's coming next. The instructor's guiding us along. Then he pointed to the ceiling and it looked like there was a mirror in the ceiling and actually what it was, all the escape air bubbles from the scuba divers were collected in the ceiling in kind of a dome-like structure. 
and he pointed up and we went up above uh, in the ceiling in the air pocket and it came up all the way to our chest and there was plenty of air. So as we're swimming out of the cave, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I bet you I could swim free dive, that means without a scuba tank, all the way back into that cave, find this air pocket, get a full breath of air, and come out. Now, if I can't find the air pocket, I got problems because I'm not going to get out. But I, I knew I could do it. It's called being young, stupid, and overloaded with testosterone. So we finished the dive, and everyone was having lunch, and I decided I would go try that out. So I took my swim fins and mask, strapped on my dive knife, and headed back to the entrance of the cave without a scuba tank, just holding my breath. Where are you going? I'm just going for a quick swim. Okay, hurry back. I have food. I'll be right back. <laughs> Yeah, I was really that stupid. Now, what's amazing is God took the stupidity in my life and made it part of a major Christian film that's coming out. Uh, 
about a year and a half ago, Jeremy Wiles called me. He's a well-known Christian film producer, does major commercials for senators and congressmen in the Florida area. Said, uh, would you like to do a movie on pornography from the Christian perspective? And I said, no, I'm not interested. He says, well, why not? I said, because the church always points to the problem, but doesn't have any solutions. He says, well, you don't understand. We've been looking on the internet for about four months. These are his words. He says, you're the only voice that seems to make any sense. And I said, okay, where are you filming it? He said, well, we bought several of your books, so we rented a Warbird Museum in Cape Canaveral, Florida. The first set, you'll have five fighter aircraft behind you, and you have 50 guys from Campus Crusade. You'll be teaching them. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. You know, only the Holy Spirit could do that. Only the Holy Spirit could bring that out of absolutely nowhere. I just absolutely love the Holy Spirit. He's amazing. He's kind of like the radical member of the Trinity. <laughs> you know, if you want to picture what the Holy Spirit's like, it's a combination between Mother Teresa and Tigger. <laughs> if you can picture that. Pigger, picture Tigger in, in a nun's habit bouncing around. Just, woo-hoo, ha-ha, yeah, everything's impossible. Anything, I get anything done. That's, that's the way he is. For me personally, I'm kind of a healing evangelist for unchurched people. It's not a point of theology. Okay, this is not a point of theology. But when God's ready to do something amazing in my life by sharing Christ with someone, I'll feel the Holy Spirit jumping up inside, inside of me, up and down. I was speaking at a large men's conference in Alabama, flying back home. They put me in first class. I hadn't been in first class in years, so I was kind of enjoying it. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden... The Holy Spirit starts jumping up inside and upside and up and down inside of me, and I'm going, "Well, this is going to be fun." Apparently, I have someone trapped at 30,000 feet in a steel tube. I got him. I'm really going to be able to share Christ with him. And I looked over, and the guy next to me had his foot up on the bulkhead, and the back of his calf was missing. So I thought that's interesting. So we started talking. He was a ranger in Vietnam. Got the back of his leg shot off, shot off putting a friend in a helicopter to medevac him out. So we started sharing war stories and going on and going on about it. And we went on and on. He's a major IT executive, travels around the world. And then he started telling me about the life that he really enjoyed. That was when he was a male stripper. Woohoo! It's great, man. You can have any woman you want. It was just great, man. It was great, great, great. And by the way, what do you do? <laughs> Only the Holy Spirit can set that kind of stuff up. I said, well, I'm a pastor and a certified sexual addiction therapist. He went, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, it turns out that he, was, uh, he had just been diagnosed with cancer two years before. His wife left him. He lost everything. Had a huge growth on his neck. It wasn't from smoking. It was just cancer. He had a little boy that he was trying to raise. He was at home in a little tiny apartment, and he was watching the 700 Club on TV, and the guy says, God is healing someone right now. Put his hand on the television. His neck was instantly healed. So he was a Catholic, so he had his faith over here and his work and his life over here. So we had an hour and a half of praying in the Spirit, just ministering to one another in the Holy Spirit, helping him to come to an united understanding of his faith and the love of God to the depth of the core of his soul. Only the Holy Spirit could do that kind of stuff. Amen. Only the Holy Spirit can do that kind of stuff. But he was trapped, just like I was trapped, and so many men are trapped in our culture. My wife and I do sexy Christian seminars around the world now, and we've done it out throughout the United States. And what we do is we start the seminar off by giving everyone who comes an intimacy quotient exam. Find out how your potential for intimacy is. Actually, what it is, you know what it is? It's a sexual addiction screening test. Now, it's not bait and switch because when you're an addict, you can't be intimate. You can have intercourse, but you can't be intimate. Guess what we found out? We have over 3,000 data points now, so it's rock-solid clinical data. The average evangelical church today, right now, in America, 60 to 70 percent of the men sitting in the pews are sexual addicts. 25 to 30 percent of the women are, they're the fastest growing segment. 50 to 58 percent of the pastors are sexual addicts. And that's not the bad story. The bad story is the primary users of internet pornography are 12 to 17 year olds. Woo! That's the church. That's the church. Now you're in a series on Revelation. This is right in the center of Revelation. You read the book of Revelation, you'll find out sexual bondage becomes a signature of the end times. We're in the end times, folks. How are we ever going to minister to this? How are we ever going to deal with this? I mean, has this ever occurred in human history? I mean, is it, how are we going to deal with this? Well, interesting enough, it's occurred many times. If you don't mind, I'll just kind of close the notion to share from my heart if I could. I was asked to teach the minor prophets in the undergraduate level, and I thought I knew the minor prophets very well. 
when you teach something, that's when you really come to know it. And I fell head over heels in love with the prophet Hosea. Amazing man. Absolutely amazing man. He's the only prophet we have from the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember after Solomon? Israel divided into two camps, ten tribes to the north, two tribes to the south. He's the only prophetic voice we have in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom was as sexualized as our culture. It was just riddled with sexual bondage. And he takes the language of that culture and he goes places that no other prophet ever went. Places where Jeremiah, Isaiah wouldn't dare go. He goes into the most perverted perversions of sexuality you've ever heard of and he finds the heartbeat of God beating powerfully right there. He takes the language of that culture and he communicates the love of God in ways that had never been communicated before. It's like a gangster rapper preaching a gospel. <laughs> this guy is really one radical dude. I mean, he's amazing. Probably the best translation of the Hebrew is actually the message translation. Hosea chapter 1. Let's look at what he has to say. This is God's message to Hosea, son of Barai. It came to him during the royal reigns of Judah's kings. Uzziah, Jothan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. That's the kingdom to the south. That's Judah. This was also the time that Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king over Israel. That's the kingdom to the north. This is where Hosea ministered. The first time God spoke to Hosea, he said, Find a whore and marry her. Now, if you find those words offensive, it's not even close to the Hebrew. They are radical. Find a whore and marry her. Make this whore the mother of your children. And here's why. The whole country has become a whorehouse. Unfaithful to God. Sign God. Whoa, this guy's in your face. He really gets your attention. He speaks in the daily, secularized language of the culture. He marries the gal. She goes right back to her old behavior. But God won't give up. Chapter 3. Then God ordered me, start all over again. Love your wife again. Your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife, love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. Precious flock, I, I really don't know that it's possible to understand what this guy is saying. And it's so important that we hear it in our culture. To understand what this guy is saying from a left brain perspective. Just looking at the grammar, looking at the historical background, looking at the geology and geogra geography of the area. Uh, that's not really, it, this guy is speaking so deep, I don't know it's possible to understand. So you have to understand it from a right brain perspective. So let me tell you a story. I just preach from my heart if I could. My name is Hosea. My profession, prophet of the Most High God, who I serve faithfully from 750 to 725 B.C. in the northern kingdom of Israel. One day as I was returning from one of my frequent prophetic crusades, as I ascended the heights of Mount Tabor, I encountered a presence that is first of all terrifying and second of all fascinating. Though rare, I realized I had stepped into the presence of the Eternal. And his voice came to me, as it were, on the crest of the wind. Hosea, I've come to talk to you about my people Israel. You know the agreement that we had, that I would be their God and they would be my people. But they have fractured our friendship. They have ruptured our relationship. Their faithfulness is like the morning dew, soon fading in the heat of their lust. We talked for a long time on top of Mount Tabor. I don't have much to say. What do you say in the presence of a holy God? But whether in the body or not, I know not. He took me down through the corridors of time and showed me incident after incident after incident after incident where the people of Israel lusted after other gods. And his voice, his voice was like the man experiencing pain, like someone whose lover had rejected them. And I knew, I knew by the tenor and tone of his voice, I knew what I'd soon hear. I knew he would declare to me, Hosea, I will wipe Israel off the face of the earth. They'll never be heard from again. But to my amazement, you know what he said? Hosea, I will save Israel. Not with battle or bow, not with horsemen or chariot, but I'll save Israel by the power of my love. I said, wow, God, that's cool. I'm sure Israel's is going to be happy to hear it, but I don't mean to be rude, sir, but what does that have to do with me? Well, I'm glad you asked, son. <laughs> I'm 
I'm glad you asked. See, I want you to be my living illustration. I want you to be my days man. I want you to become a prophetic, dynamic illustration of my love for Israel. But before I send you, there's one thing we need to talk about. I listened in on your last prophetic crusade. Your adroit of speech and skill of theology. But there's one point you totally missed. It's totally devoid. You have no comprehension of how high and how deep and how wide and how broad my love is. For all people. Your love is narrow. It's parochial. It's in little religious boxes. Therefore, to prepare you to be my spokesman, I'm going to take you through the crucible of domestic difficulties. It's called marriage. You ever been there? I said, well, God, that doesn't sound like a bad deal to me. An almighty, sovereign God selecting your bride. In fact, I was just talking to myself recently. Self, you know what? It's time for you to get married. Now, I know just the gal for me. Woo, she's a Hebrew fox. Ah, ah. She is a looker. I mean, she comes from a good Jewish family, a good prophetic home. And she's been to all my prophetic crusades. In fact, she helped me pass out Ten Commandment tracts my last crusade. She's the gal for me. I can't wait, God. This is going to be awesome. God said, I know the woman you speak thereof. She will make someone a great wife. She's not the gal I've selected for you. The gal I've selected for you doesn't come from a good Jewish home. Doesn't come from a prophet's home. She's a prostitute in the temple of Baal. Can you comprehend how those words ripped across the fabric of my soul? I mean, here was God, who I'd served faithfully in purity for 30 years, asking me to do something I could not do, I would not do. I would not be part of this travesty. I'll not bring this shame upon the prophetic community. No, I will not. Do, no, I will not do it. And after I made a final declaration, I braced myself. So I was talking to Holy God, and I knew death would run right over the top of me. So I stood on top of Mount Tabor, and I said, come on, bring it on, death, come on. After I was there for about an hour, I opened one eye looking for that pale rider of death. Opened the other eye looking for the presence of God. Since neither. So I thought it was time to make a strategic retreat. That's when God said, and her name is Gomer. Gomer, God. Gomer. Who would want to marry a woman by the name of Gomer? <laughs> Gomer? Come on, God. And can't you pick someone else? Her name is Gomer, and I want you to marry her. Well, you better give me a pretty good reason for that. I mean, when am I going to tell mom and dad, huh? When am I going to tell the prophetic community, huh? Pastor goes on a retreat and he comes back and tells everybody he has to marry a woman from a topless club. How's that going to go over? That's going to go over really good. Huh? I mean, and besides, didn't you say everything should be done for your glory? What glory do you get out of bringing a prostitute and a prophet together? What glory do you get out of bringing wretchedness and righteousness together? What glory do you get out of bringing the secular and sacred together? What glory do you bring out, get out of bringing the terrestrial and the celestial together? What glory do you get? That's when I earned a very important lesson. God said, you know when we started this partnership, I told you I was senior partner. <laughs> Therefore, I will make decisions and frequently not bother to inform you. And the question then will be faith. Not faith does it make sense. Not faith do you understand. But faith to trust my heart when you can't trace my hand. Besides that, I don't submit divine wisdom to the limited spectrum of human understanding. When you're ready to obey, then we'll talk. It took me a while, but you know, it's interesting. When you get on that highway of obedience, you start hearing God again. See, let me tell you why I brought a prostitute and a prophet together. Because I want all the gomers of human history, all the guy gomers and the gal gomers of human history, to understand that God loves the unlovely. God loves the unlovely. You can break God's heart, but you can't break his love. You can break his heart, but you can never break his love. I'm so glad God loved that woman. She tried so hard. Oh, the gal, she tried hard. She, she gave it her best shot. Remember one day she came back from shopping, her arms full of packages, and she says, Hosea, come see. She says, I, I got my hair redone. I'm a, I'm a prophet's wife now, not a prostitute. I got new dresses with longer hems. 
I, I, I got my makeup done correctly. I'm not hanging out with the people down at the topless bar anymore. I'm a prophet's wife. But you know, every time he, she'd come to the church, she walked through the foyer, there'd be a little group of people say, here comes old, you know what they called her. They never let her forget her past. She was caught between a vicious push and a violent pull. The push of their self-righteousness and the pull of her past. Finally, she came to me one day and she said, this is your religion. I want nothing to do with it. And eventually she was gone. She left. It took me about three or four months, but I finally decided I was going to have it out with God. I went back up on top of Mount Tabor, and I decided I'd get the first words in this time. I said, God, I told you. And God said, shush, son, sit down. I have one question for you. One question. Do you love her? Do I love her? Are you kidding? The woman who made me a humiliated public spectacle? The woman who humiliated me? Come on. Do I love her? Yes. Do you love her? Well, God, is there anyone else but you and me up here? No, it's just us. God, I love her. I love her. I love her. I don't understand why, but I love her. With all my heart. God said, good, now you're ready to go tell my people who are called by my name, if they'll repent, turn from their sins, and cry out to me, I will heal the land. And I went rumbling, bumbling, stumbling, falling off the top of that mountain, got down to the bottom, got ready to take off. God said, one more thing, what? What, God? I want you to understand something. I'm sending you so that the, love, the unlovely wouldn't understand I love them. But more importantly, so the forgiven would learn to forgive. Because you have a righteousness, but it's a self-righteousness. And the reason I bring you up a juxtaposition of people that are, in your perception, sinful, is so you can see what's inside of you will come out. That's why I brought you together. So you have a form of righteousness, but it's a self-righteousness. It's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now it'll soon be everyone blind and toothless. Well, let's step out of his sandals for just a moment. Maybe I can put it this way. Now, let me ask you the question. Are you sexually normal? Well, what do you mean? How are you going to find that out? Well, I just happened to brought a couple questions along. Let's find out if you're sexually normal. Question number one. I believe that sex should come naturally. Well, of course. Birds do it. Bees do it. Just the Nike motto, just do it. Everybody does it. That's the biological view of sexuality. It's a very, very low view of sexuality. You have to understand something. We're, we're, we're not like the animals. We're not just an animal. But the female of our species is the only female of any species that can have a climaxes. Now, there are a couple scientists that contend that there's this particular species of giant ape that can have climaxes. The female of that species can. But they can't prove it, and she's not talking. See, sex is the brain. That's the sexiest part of your body. It's about relationship. It's not about just hormones. Well, question number two, moving right along. I believe the best sex should be spontaneous. Well, hello, hello, God, come on, give me a break. You see her, some enchanted evening across the dance floor. Oh, got to have her, got to have her. Come here, come here, come here, girl, girl. What kind of control is that? What kind of responsibility is that? None. Now, I counsel about 18 to 20 pastors who are sexual addicts a month. Our office has 40 to 60 pastors coming in. When you have 50, 58 percent of pastors are sexual addicts, they have nowhere to go. Now, I've never counseled an addict, a pastor, in the last 25 years who doesn't love God with all their heart, doesn't read the Bible daily on a regular basis, prays regularly, loves his wife, and can't stop his behavior. It's not just simply a moral problem, it's a brain problem. We happen to live in a culture that's messing with your brain on an ongoing basis, setting you up for bondage. That's why the next generation is getting butchered. Primary users are in internet pornography are 12 to 17 year olds. We have a new phenomenon now that's come up just recently in sexual addiction therapy. 15 to 16 year olds are guys who are having erectile dysfunction because they're so focused on porn they can't respond to a real woman. It's changing the whole culture. Now, would I come here to hear all this bad news? Well, there's something you need to understand. The most sexualized culture in the ancient Near East was Rome. 
And where was the church born? In Rome. The church rose up with such push, passion and purity, it turned that culture right side up. I believe a real awakening has come in the church. We have only two options. The next 10 years, 15 years, we either get it and start dealing with this and stop shaming people, or we are over. But I believe that God's going to raise up a Joshua generation, next generation. It's going to walk with such purity and power. They're going to blow the gates of hell flat. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Well, my point is this. I counsel a lot of pastors with sexual addicts. I don't even try to laugh anymore when a guy has an affair and he comes in, sits down, and he goes, it just happened. <laughs> it just happened right. Sure. Yeah, you, you, you hit all that money from your wife. You hit all that time you're off there. You're ma manipulating. If you'd taken the same time, effort, and energy and put it in your marriage, you'd have a good marriage by now. Yeah. And you can say amen to that one. Yeah. But people get set up in our culture. Next question. You may not admit it, but do you use your partner's sexual response to you as a measure of your sexual adequacy? Well, I've gone from preaching to meddling now. Now, there's no question if you're married, you want to be responsive to your wife. But if you make your ego structure equated to how she sexually responds to you and how well you're doing, welcome to erectile dysfunction. Now, I probably never said this in this church, had that word, but erectile dysfunction is something that's become predominant in our culture. Because we're so addicted and so crazy, the way we're relating to each other. Moving right along, next question. You tend to focus on intercourse. All the guys are going, is there any other option? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to understand, there are other options. 80% of a woman's sexual needs are met simply by being held in a safe environment with her husband. Amen. Amen, there you go. <laughs> because <laughs> when she's being held in a safe environment she's getting oxytocin hits in her brain she's on a high that's fulfilling for her now the problem is guys have ten times the level of testosterone and only one-fifth the level of estrogen that a woman has so that messes up our brain now I say it's a problem because what they did is they took a a female monkey and they pumped her as full of testosterone as the male monkeys were she started acting sexually like the male monkeys when they did that when I have a group of guys that I'm mentoring and I make that comment an arm will go up Dr. Roberts well, where can I get some of that <laughs> put that in my wife Steve we'd have a great day <laughs> well there'd be a couple problems in about six months you'd be shaving with her ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh, ooh that's a grim picture <laughs> In about six months, she'd be arm wrestling with you and whipping you. <laughs> so we have to understand our differences. <laughs> and God created us different like that so that, well, I can put it this way. I used to have time to mentor and uh, do premarital counseling with young couples. And I'd always ask the young guy, I'd say, son, do you know what marriage is for? And he'd look at me like, oh, yeah, woman, woman, woman. I said, no, no, son, look, 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 look. Marriage is for one purpose, it's to crucify you. <laughs> it's to crucify you. You're a young, male, self-centered idiot. You do not know how self-centered you are. She's going to give you an alphabetical list on a daily basis on how sinkingly self-centered you are. <laughs> and all the ladies went, amen, amen. <laughs> I remember I tried to tell him, remember this is one guy, Oxford educated guy. I tried to tell him, I'd say, Hey, you know, marriage is going to hurt. And he goes, yeah. He never would listen. And about six months later, he's, Dr. Roberts, what, what? This, I don't make this stuff up. I, these guys are amazing. He goes, this woman, she's killing me. I said, well, I told you she was going to do that. And then he puffed his chest out. I kid you not. This is what he said. But I'm head of the house. We're going, son, do you know what that means? Well, no, sir, I don't. It means you're first to the cross. When <laughs> God grabs the hammer and nails, he's come looking for you, first of all. Okay? You tend to confuse hormone prime with sexual prime. What in heaven's name is he talking about? The highest level of testosterone you'll ever have in your body is when you're what age, sir? 19 years of age. 
You have testosterone squirting out of both sides of your head. <laughs> you're responding to a woman, any woman, <laughs> it's just the way, you're, the way you're functioning. Okay? The hormone prime for a woman is when? 35. So if you get this young guy who's masturbating his brains out, and he's learning to be very self-focused, he's going to be a horrible lover. His wife will be very frustrated. That's why you have 20 to 30 percent of women who are married in America never experience climaxes, because the whole thing is about him. See, intimacy is not intercourse. Intimacy is not being comfortable and close. Intimacy is being uncomfortably close. It's allowing someone to look down into your soul, warts and all. That's why I don't think it's possible to experience real intimacy to your 30, 40, 50, 60 years of age. So you can understand who you are. So I guess I can put it this way. Your cellulite level probably equals your intimacy level. <laughs> it's a little countercultural, isn't it? Now, why did I take you through those stupid questions? See how deeply the culture has affected your thinking. Scripture is radical. Hosea got it right. Well, how are we ever going to minister to this culture? Well, how did Hosea's story end? Well, we don't have the exact details, but I would kind of picture it this way. We've got enough where we can take a pretty good guess of what happened. About two or three years later, he's raising three small kids on his own, a single dad in that culture, which is kind of very difficult. He's out working in the field, and he hears his voice. Hosea! 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 He looks across the field. He can't see who it is. Puts a gather sack over his shoulder, comes through the barley field, walks up to the individual. It's a member of the prophetic community. He says, uh, I was just down at the marketplace. Your old wife, you know, she's such a burnt out as a hooker. She's being sold as a common slave. Don't know what you do with that information. Just thought you'd like to know. And walks off. Hosea walks into his tent to get some sense of privacy away from the kids. And he goes, God, what now? God says, I thought you said you loved her. Well, I do. Then love her all the way. Go get her. Hosea comes to his feet, puts his prophetic robe on, heads into the community. And apparently this guy told everyone else in the community because there's a little cobble of people going, there's Hosea, he's going to have the last laugh. There's another group of people there. There's Hosea, the prophet, he's going to stick the bony finger of righteousness in his ex-wife's filthy face. And Hosea's going, but they don't know my heart. Turns the corner and hears the auctioneer cry out, hey guys, i got an old burned out hooker. She's not worth much. Anyone want to bid anything for her? Hosea has to suffer the indignity of listening to other men bid on his wife. Finally, one guy says, oh, I'll give her six shekels for her. Hosea says, seven. Guys, I understand, and now there's an interest in this gal, so the bidding war is on. Eight. Hosea says, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Hosea doesn't have much money. Fifteen and a half shekels sold to the highest bidder. This is the way I picture it. Hosea comes up to get his wife off the auction block. She would be totally nude, not a stitch of clothing on, totally publicly humiliated. He comes up to get his wife, and I see him taking his prophetic robe off and covering his wife's nakedness. And that's what Jesus does for us on a daily basis. You know that? He covers your sin on a daily basis. God is not an uptight evangelical. He's not obsessed with your sin. He died for it already. That thing that you don't want anyone else to know about, God knows all about it. You know what he says? That's where I want to work your next miracle. That's where I want to work my next miracle. Get over your bad self already together. I died for it. Learn to live in my love and my grace. Hosea covers her, helps her step off the auction block. She stumbles and falls. She looks up at Hosea and she says, I'm so sorry. I don't deserve to be your wife. Can I be your slave? I picture Hosea. You've got to understand this guy. I picture Hosea saying, I don't need a slave. I need a wife. My children don't need a slave. They need a mother. You know, I think it probably took him about six months to figure this out. God, that's the way you deal with me, isn't it? Have you ever noticed this? The closer you get to God, the more conscious you are of your sin. Not because God's pointing it out. But because the glory of his presence shines in dark areas of your life that you never even realized before. 
I mean, I'm dealing with stuff now I never even noticed before. My wife knew it all along. <laughs> she pointed it out, but I ignored it. But now I'm going, I can see it. That's the kind of love we need to have in this culture if we're going to change our culture. If we're going to have real revival. It's not going to be pointing fingers at people. It's going out and redeeming them out of the pit and having people come to church who you don't like, who make you uncomfortable, who are walking in sin. Church has to be a place where it's okay not to be okay. Can I hear an amen on that one? That has to be a place. Because people have no hope apart from the church of Jesus Christ. And when we have little religious boxes that we like certain people and don't like other people, we're just literally cutting off the gospel. Maybe I can put it this way to finally wrap it all up. I looked at my counseling appointment, this calendar, and I had an appointment at 7 o'clock in the morning on Friday morning. That wasn't too bad, but I looked at who it was. It was a cocaine sex addict. I went, oh, this is going to hurt. Because it rips your heart out to counsel people like this. It just rips your heart out. So I drove up, and I was, I was dreading the appointment. This guy was pretty severe, sex addict and alcohol. Cocaine. They use 70% of cocaine addicts or sex addicts. That's why they send them to rehab and they never get healed because they don't deep with it, deal with the deeper problem, which is sexual addiction. It's the deepest addiction of all. So I drove up and I called his name Frank and he was there and he's smiling from ear to ear. And I went, Hi, Frank, how you doing? Great. I said, uh, Why'd you come, Frank? He said, Well, I just think God called me to bless you this morning. I said, Frank, wh- how, how does that work? He said, I think God told me to come and wash your feet. I said, Frank, it's 7 o'clock in the morning. It's Oregon. It's cold. It's raining. He said, I know I heated the water. (laughs) He's got me. (laughs) So he goes to the construction truck and pulls out this big pan of steaming hot water, brings it in the office, sets it down, and he starts taking my shoes and socks off. And I am struggling. I mean, I'm going, oh, man, oh, oh. God said, Ted, why are you struggling? Now, God doesn't ask questions for information. Have you realized that? (laughs) He is scary smart, (laughs) okay? He's going, McFly, hello, hello. Do you get it? Do you get it? Finally, I'm sitting there having this private discussion with God, and I'm going, yeah, because I'm not in control. With seven abusive stepfathers, an alcoholic mother, and I was an illegitimate child, I got a lot of pain in my life. So I got to be in control. When I'm preaching and counseling, I'm in control. I feel comfortable. I'm not in control right now, God, and I don't feel comfortable. I'll never forget what God said to me. He says, yeah, that's why I have a hard time loving you. You won't let me love you. I love you, son. Will you let me love you? I still remember the moment. It's so hard for me to drop the walls down. Marine Corps fighter pilot, counselor, stuff. You know, you just got walls. You got walls. When you have seven fathers using you for a punching bag, you get a lot of walls in your life. I'm letting the walls come down. It feels so vulnerable. It's just really scary. And right at that point, (laughs) Frank looks up at me. The cocaine sex addict, he says, I think I've got a prophetic word for you. (laughs) Yeah, that's God. A cocaine sex addict got a prophetic word. That's God. Yes, right on. That's God. (laughs) And, and I was an illegitimate child, I told you that. That sets the stage for what's going to happen next. Frank looks at me and he says, I think I've got a prophetic word for you. I says, what is it, Frank? He says, I'm not sure. I said, Frank, come on, come on, come on. It's got to be God. He said, well, I thought I heard God say when you're in your mother's womb, I saw how you fought for life. And I loved your warrior's heart. See, mom strapped her stomach down so she wouldn't show. I've got a scar down the left side of my chest. She almost killed me. Frank had no way of knowing that. No way of knowing that. And it was just like God went, gotcha, son. I love you. I've been tracking you down the corridors of time. And I love you. That's the God we serve. When we proclaim that kind of God in this culture, you, you can't have enough room for people to come. And when we talk about the issues and allow them to be vulnerable and not shame them about the issues they're struggling with, we we'll change our world, folks. The church is in a crossroads where either we're going to discover the love of outrageous love of God 
Oh, we're over. But I don't think God's even begun to give up on us because he'll never give up on us. And he's bringing us into a revival of the grace of God to the levels of which we've never experienced before. The world's going to get worse and worse and worse. Guess what? We're going to shine brighter and brighter and brighter because the love of God's going to settle down in the core of our being. Amen? 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 Let's pray. Well, precious flock, I have just one simple question for you. Some of you may be visiting. Some of you may have been drugged here by a friend. There's skid marks all the way in the front door. That's okay because God has a divine appointment with you. Have you said yes to this magnificent Christ? That's the question I have for you. Maybe you've always seen God as a traffic cop in heaven ready to write you the next ticket. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. He came to take the hit for you. That's the good news. You don't have to live in shame or guilt or embarrassment of your past or the present or anything you've ever done. God knows all about it, and he's totally accepted you. Or maybe you've said yes to Christ, and you got hurt along the way. People wounded you. People in church will hurt you because they're hurting. And you pull back. Don't you think it's time for you to come all the way home to Father God and to his embrace? Put all the cards on the table. Just simply say, God, here I am. Take all of me. I'm holding nothing back. Wherever you are in that spectrum need, you then saying yes to Christ for the first time or coming all the way home to Father God. I want to pray with you. I'm not going to point you out or embarrass you. But as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm just going to ask you in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your head and raise your hand. And all you're saying is, Pastor Ted, would you pray for me? I want to know God's love like that. My friend, if that's where you're at, would you be bold enough right where you're seated just to raise your head and raise your hand? Let me know who I'm praying with this morning. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. In the center section? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Over here on my left? Yeah. Great. Thank you. And all the way over here? Yes, sir. Yeah. Wow. God, so many precious people that you made a divine appointment with today to meet. And Lord, we're raising our hands not to a man, but to take the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. And we're saying in that simple gesture, Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you for dying for me, for taking the hit for me. I don't understand it. I don't even remotely comprehend it. But my heart says yes. And thank you for raising from the dead. Because your word says the same Holy Spirit that raised you from the dead can also be at work in my life, bringing me to become the kind of man that I really cry to be, the kind of woman I cry to be, the kind of dad, the kind of mom, the kind of person that I cry to be. And Lord, while you're at it, Charlie Shedd had a great prayer, Lord. Would you help me understand what you had in mind when you created the original me? I can become such a cheap copy of so many other people. God, would you show me how to live my life with abandonment totally for you and fulfill the purpose that you created me to fulfill before the beginning of time? So, Father God, this is my simple and humble prayer. Jesus, you be the Lord of my life in this moment right on into eternity. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's lift an applause offering unto the Lord. Now, so many of you raised your hands. That's the first step. The second step is, God put it really well. Christ says, unless you confess me before man, I'll not confess you before the Father. So before you leave here, you've got to tell someone, I made that decision today. You got to tell someone, I made it. Just the person next to you might want to say, hey, I made it, and then run for the door, whatever. But just do it. <laughs>